How do you feel about rules? Should we think in terms of obeying a moral code, a list of do's and don'ts? Or is that approach to ethics more appropriate for fools, perhaps, but not for sophisticated, educated people? I was once reminded in a sermon that I'd heard that Joseph Fletcher, the founder of Playboy, objected to rules altogether. He insisted that you can't make ethical generalizations beginning, thou shalt and thou shalt not. What you have to do, he said, is to work out the most loving thing to do, for nothing is intrinsically right or wrong. It all depends upon the situation. Now, it's not surprising that Fletcher's ideas caught on and took off in the heady days of the permissive 1960s. People just loved his idea that adultery might be a loving thing to do. The problem is, of course, people have ended up simply following their own personal judgment. The fact is, as many messed up marriages have subsequently shown, we're neither good enough or wise enough to work out what is right for ourselves and for others. So come with me today to Colossians chapter 3 and Paul's opening words. So if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Now what Paul seems to be saying here is a little confusing at first, but it isn't really. If you've been raised with Christ, he is saying, set your hearts where Christ is. And he's got in mind that God has given us a new status for all those who have turned to Jesus Christ. He's saying by implication, your names are written in the book of life in heaven. But when he says, for you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God, when Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He's speaking there about an event that's yet to happen. The new status of Christians has yet to be revealed. So the tension of space and time that he's playing out here. One level, our names are written in heaven. At another level, the reality of that has yet to be revealed. So for the time being, professing Christians have a foot in two worlds, a visible identity in this world, but at the same time an invisible identity in God's new world. Following the flow of his argument, we see that Paul was urging the Colossian readers to let the light of their resurrection state fall on every aspect of their life, their goals and priorities, their actions, their words, and their attitudes. Everything was to reflect this new identity. Since you have been raised to a new life in Christ, set your hearts and minds on things that are above. Put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature. Now, it's most important that we hear this. But it's very different from the kind of legalism that Paul has written about in the previous chapter, Colossians chapter 2. The legalism that Paul had rejected there was, here's a list of rules, obey them, and somehow you'll be able to manoeuvre yourself over the line into the presence of God, into his heaven. Well, that's the very opposite of what Paul is saying here. Here he is saying, since you've been given a new status by God, since you now belong to God's kingdom, live appropriately. There are two kinds of religion. One says do, the other says done. Most people say we need to do certain things to come to God, obey his rules and so on. Well, Paul is saying God has done all that needs to be done to transfer us into his presence. However, what he is saying here is that God, having done all of that for us, he now expects us to live the new life that he's given us. So what he requires of us remains the same as it always was, because he doesn't change. But the motive for following him has. That has changed dramatically. Now this is most important, for there's often misunderstanding about 
Paul's hostility to the law. What Paul was objecting to is our attempt to obtain God's favour by following rules. But the only logic that Paul is prepared to accept is this. Since you have been raised with Christ, so the motive is not pride or fear, but love and thankfulness, the new status we have, and what a world of difference that is. So the key to real Christian living lies in what it means to be a Christian. Know who you are and live consistently. So let's look quickly at three sets of imperatives that Paul sets out in this chapter. They have to do with sexuality, the tongue, and relationships. So verse 5, Put to death therefore what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul is tough, but very honest here. Call yourself a Christian, he is saying, then sex outside of marriage is not on. You used to do what you felt was right, he's saying, but now you have linked yourself with Jesus Christ, you must put to death such behaviour. Now people often argue that they are making love, but Paul says the reality is you're making self-gratification. And that's why he's, what he's getting at when he says greedy. Well, there you go again, you may mumble. Telling me everything that I want to do is either immoral, illegal, or fattening. But Paul is right. I came across an article recently suggesting that the internet is having a negative impact on marriages. People are so consumed by the net, and especially sex on the net, that they've got no time for their marriage partner. What strange paradoxes we are wanting to ogle at pictures more than enjoy the precious gifts of the personal, intimate relationship of marriage. Well, the fact is, God is not interested in spoiling anyone's fun. He's working out a new world where we'll have more pleasure, more fun than anything that we can begin to imagine. And yet, what do we do? We confine ourselves to gluing our eyes to this world. And then Paul goes on to speak about the tongue. Verse 8, But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices, and have clothed yourself with a new self. Clothed yourselves with a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. It seems rather strange to us that Paul has words about controlling the tongue in the same paragraph as his words about control of our sexuality. Anger, wrath, malice, slander and foul talk are so much part of everyday language that it seems incongruous that they should be put alongside sins of the flesh. Well, perhaps that shows just how seared our consciences are. You remember, may remember that Jesus said angry words are the same as murder. Well, what we forget is that the New Testament sees the tongue as the most sin-prone organ. James says that the tongue is a restless evil. Malice, obscenity, rage, all offend, all cause damage. Therefore, put off the old self, Paul says. It isn't consistent with your new nature. Now, when I start expounding texts like this, some people tell me that Paul is totally unrealistic. People who live the way you're talking about are dull and boring, they say. Nobody likes a saint. They're too aloof. To be warm, attractive human being, you've got to be a little sinful. Well, to say that, of course, is to forget what true humanity is. To be truly human is to be like God. So let me ask this question. Do you get the impression that Jesus was a dull, boring personality? I doubt whether he would have received so many dinner invitations if he was dull and boring. He was, in fact, man as man was meant to be. And that brings us to Paul's concluding comment. It's there in verse 11. In that renewal there is no longer Greek and Jew, some circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, 
but Christ is all and in all. What is it that most people in the world are crying for at the present? It's the breakdown of our barriers that divide, be they race or religion or whatever. People would love a world where we don't need peacekeeping armies or UN troops having to be deployed because there's no greed or conflict or injustice. A world which doesn't need a welfare service because people actually care for one another. A world which doesn't need lawyers because people settle any differences they have without litigious confrontation. Most people would love a world without antagonism, without need, without loneliness, a world where there is love. Well, Paul is telling us that the church ought to aim at being such a society. Why? Well, because that's the way of God's new world. We shan't reach it perfectly. Well, not yet, because we've still got one foot in the present world. We'll be disappointed with one another. We shan't always be as tolerant as we should. We shan't always love one another as we ought or forgive one another as we should. But Paul is saying we should try. That should be our goal. Because of the purpose of the church is to set up a signpost to that other universe so that the world can see and wonder. Paul is adamant that we need to urge one another to live live out the reality of that resurrection state that Christ has made possible for us. We ought in turn to be a microcosm pointing beyond this age, this world, to heaven itself. Rules can't produce that. You know, one of the things that puts off many people about Christianity is the association with rules. More than the rules, more than rules that discourage people I can't keep them up, they say. I admire Christians, but I haven't got it in me to keep all those rules. Well, let Paul put you right. Christianity does not begin with rules, but with life. The life made possible by Jesus Christ at the first Easter, when he died and rose again. Christianity begins when God now takes you out of this present world and gives you a new identity in his new world. So don't be put off by the lifestyle of Christianity which looks difficult. For God gives you new life and with that the power to begin to live as you should.